What is up, Mets fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Mets Up Podcast. We actually, it, it's weird that this is a positive one because just such a poor taste in our mouth from the last game of the series against the Marlins. But theoretically speaking, the Mets beat the Marlins, won the series, did their job for the most part. But we do have to talk about what happened on Sunday. Left a pretty bad taste in our mouth. We'll go over all the decisions made by Carlos Mendoza, what happened in this game, and just, just as we do with every series. So if you like what you're listening to and or watching over here, make sure to drop a like on the YouTube video and subscribe to the YouTube channel. We did just drop our Top 25 Prospects video yesterday. So if you haven't seen that, after you watch the podcast, go there, give it a listen. We're, it's pretty good. It's good content. If you like what you're listening to here as well, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, drop us a rating, drop us a review, download and subscribe. And don't forget to follow us on our social media at MetsUp. Links will be in the description over on the YouTube channel. James, we had a late night last night, rock and roll. We were holding down the shuffleboard table. We walked in at 1.30. We didn't leave the table until we were done. We were in it. How you feeling? Oh, great. Undefeated night in shuffleboard. Uh, we played one of the games of a lifetime. We had a crowd. It was it was truly a back and forth affair. It felt like a seven game series. It was it was perfect. It was it was peak athletics. But and we also have softball championship Monday tonight. Tuesday. So I, Tuesday. Tuesday. Oh, really? It got moved. You didn't see it got postponed? Oh no, I got switched. Oh god. Postponed. Damn. Tuesday, eight thirty. Damn. That's huge. That's not, breaking news to James Shiano. Breaking news. Podcast. I really wanted to go to the Mets game on Tuesday. I made plans with my cousin. I was with on the, <laughs> over the weekend to go to the Mets game Tuesday. All right. So that's cash now. Whatever. But annoying way to end this Mets series. Like I really wanted to be more positive, more happy. A sweep of the Marlins was what this team needed after the horrible week last week and what this team really could have used and what this team seemed like they were set up to do. And they just found a way to lose this game on Sunday. Still now two games behind the Braves for the wild card race. Still just not really not really clicking, not really jumping up another level, not really rising to the occasion, still just stuck in this little doldrum, this little horrible, weird stretch that we're in, which just feels like it's getting harder and harder to climb out of it. Yeah, there's an abil- or inability right now to like step on the throats, and Sunday was a game like, to step on the Marlins' throats because they pitched, they played so well Saturday. Luis Severino was amazing, complete game shutout, phenomenal on the mound. Everybody was picking each other up, and Friday night was really good too, just smack the ball, like having a really good day at the plate. So for Sunday, the way that that game went, I think we should talk about that first. Just it's what's fresh in our mind, what's fresh in everybody's mind. You want to hear about that. A lot of things to get mad about in this game. Where do we want to start? I, I made the list in the notes. I'll, I'll read the list. This is a good one. So um, the Mets in this game had the 11 hardest hit balls in the entire nice. game. So that's a good one. They had You had to get the 12th hardest hit ball, and that was Ada Lopez's third inning triple, which was the only extra base hit the Marlins even had in this game. Uh, our bullpen was allergic to strikes. But, I got the stats right here. Where is it? So our bullpen this game between Brazoban, Reed Garrett, and Phil Maton walked three hitters, gave up four hits, and gave up two earned runs, how we lost the game. But also with that, didn't allow a single hard hit ball to any of the Marlins players. We only allowed two hard hit balls in the entire game. And again, the last one was in the third inning off of Paul Blackburn. And then you just have the situation where you're in the ninth inning and you're rallying to tie the game. And your first two guys gone against Calvin Fauche, who's a I don't think he's a bad reliever. I think he's I definitely think he, not good though. I think he could close on, on most teams. Like he throws no, ninety eight. No. His sweeper, he's ninety mile an hour sweeper, ninety six mile an hour cutter. I don't think I'm not, not going to get there yet. I'm not going. No, you were just, watching. You were listening. No, I, I watched the whole thing. I just synced up with the radio. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah I, I wasn't going to listen to those. <laughs> I wasn't going to listen to record on Roku. That just was never going to happen. Add that but, to the list. <laughs> add that to the list. But you get the first two men on. You have all the momentum. The crowd's rocking. People are feeling it. Uh, based on the win probability on baseball savant, they actually had a 50% chance to win the game down by one with first and second on, nobody out. And then for some reason, Jeff McNeil comes to the plate and Carlos Mendoza asks him to bunt in a situation where you have you have three outs left in a baseball game and you were willing to sacrifice 33% of them and seemingly only be content with tying the game. It made no fucking sense to me. The top of the other coming up as well as Jeff swinging the bat. I thought it was a stupid decision. I think that decision... It's not the reason they lost the game, but in that moment, it hurt them hurt them dramatically in trying to win it. Both things can be true. It was a bad decision to bunt. That was a major loser move. Like you said, you're giving up outs when you are losing. With an opportunity to win the game, no outs, first and second. That is a prime opportunity to take the lead in the ninth and win the game. The Mets played for the tie. Bad decision. The other thing that is also true along with that is the fact that if the bunt is called, which it was, Jeff McNeil does have to get the bunt down. Totally. And that is the other issue here, too. And I think sometimes a lot like in these conversations about game theory and philosophy and how to how to play these situations, you can make the wrong decision, but you need to be able to execute. And the Mets did not execute on the wrong decision, which double makes it bad because now 
Theoretically, if Jeff McNeil got that bunt down, Francisco Lindor's ball brings Jose Iglesias home. Tie ball. Theoretically. So I understand the Mets fans that I was getting an argument on Twitter and that are taking the stance of Jeff McNeil's got to get the bunt down. There was no wrong decision. Tie game. You go into extras. But in the same ilk, why are we playing to go into extras? You were playing to win the game. You have to go for the win there. The, the Marlins were reeling. They were not looking great. I mean, they didn't look great all game, regardless. They look great you, had those, you had them on the ropes. You literally had a chance to beat them, and you decided to go for the tie. If it was 3-3, three, three, I'm cool with that bunt because you were playing for the winning run. But I don't love the idea of giving up an out to get the tying run 90 feet closer when realistically it's not – a tie, like whatever, especially with these new extra inning rules, like it is all Fakakta and everything. Like you could just give up three the next thing, game over. I don't know. I don't like trying to extend the game there. Yeah, and also it's just again, like people always like to say, like the the thing, like oh well, if he gets that bunt down, for Francisco Lindor drives him in. I don't think that if um if that bunt got down, that guy was on third base. I don't think you're pitched the same way the next. No, time. you're not either. Like Francisco Lindor, the ball he hit out was um it was a sinker that was high in the zone. Again, Fauche throws this 98 mile an hour sinker that has a lot of, a lot of dip and a lot of run on it, so it's it's a really good pitch. But I don't think that you're going to give a hitter like Francisco Lindor three pitches high in the zone if you're trying to avoid fly balls. You know what I mean? Like yeah. everything changes afterwards. It's not like one to one. It's not it's not going to carry over. It's all butterfly effect. But still, like you're right. So it's 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 blame on both Mendoza and McNeil. Mendoza for making that decision and for McNeil for not executing at all. Because even if he just doesn't strike out, like everything yeah. could have been different. Like if he just hits a ground ball and moves the runners, if he hits a dribbler, if he hits a single, like he could have hit. But then he wound up starting this at bat with two strikes because he bunted, he pulled back. He bunted, he pulled back again, got a strike, and he popped up a bunt, which was like, oh my God, yeah. why are we doing this? And that was it. It was over after that. It was just, I don't know. It, it, the whole thing felt deflated after that, especially because after that, the last grievance from this game, especially his ninth inning, Francisco Lindor is a piss missile of center I field. That, that's a home run in five parks, including Lone Depot Park in Miami, which is so which is the worst part. Insult to injury. Had over 600 expected batting average. I can't find the catch probability. I don't know how to do that in baseball savant. I'm a pitching guy. I don't know how to find the defensive stuff in game, but I'm sure it was hard. Pache had, had ran a long way to get that ball. He was playing in and towards left field, and he wound up catching that ball on the warning track, on a fly. Willie Mays over his shoulder. Yeah, <laughs> but Keith around how he mentioned that they were like that wasn't Willie Mays, but like that was Shades of it. Yeah. He just made a he made a beeline to a spot in the warning track. You never see center fielders make catches like that and balls that hit 100 miles an hour on a rope. So that was just ridiculous. It felt like it was all culminating in him having a walk off there. It didn't happen. You had just that bad at bat right after that. Also, some some good vibes got sucked away for when Nimmo left with the shoulder injury. Oh. Then Alvarez was on deck. It's just, the whole thing was just like ah this and like it it doesn't fully ru- ruin. The vibe of Friday and Saturday because they won no. really good games. They pitch really well. But we have to start talking about this because this is definitely the most frustrating thing and it really annoys me. Some other things that frustrated me in this game too. Alvarez. Got to make that play at the plate. Yeah. Like, that ball's got to stay in the glove. Like I, I understand it's not – it's a bang-bang play. It's tough. It, it, whatever you want to say. And we love Francisco Alvarez over here. But he simply like just has to be better. He has been pretty terrible now for, what, like a month going on? Month and a half, and the Marlins' second run in this game, the tying run, was a pass ball by Luis Torrens that looked yeah. not that pass ballish. But I don't know, just that two two catching defensive gaffes seemed to lead to two runs, which sucks. That and the other thing too is I didn't understand Carlos Mendoza's bullpen management in this game because the bullpen was fully rested. They did not use anybody yesterday because Luis Severino went nine innings beautifully, awesome. And Friday, Manaya went seven and Budo went two. Correct. So the bullpen was fully rested. Waskar Brazoban against his former team in a tight game for a guy who, let's just say what it is, he's been struggling since he's been a Met. He hasn't been very good. Didn't love that decision. I know he didn't get hit hard. He got nickel and dime basically for these little blue pits and kind of nonsense stuff that was going on. But he's starting to get to the point where it's like, man, this guy never has an easy outing no matter what. And yes, Luis Trenz did miss that ball, but he did still spike a ball. Like... As much as he needs to make that block, Wasco yeah. Brasbon also needs to throw a better pitch because he's yeah, he not does. helping the situation either. He's been pretty terrible since he's moved over here. And then to go to Reed Garrett was fine. Reed Garrett came in, shut the door. I don't know why he didn't start the eighth with Phil Maton. Why did he go to Garrett again? It felt like trying to do a little bit too much and trying to get them out and be like, I can give Maton one more day. And then when they did get into trouble, went Maton instead of Diaz in what felt like the most important outs of the game, especially if they have the opportunity to win in the ninth. This was one of the, and this has been happening a little bit more, and I don't think it's fair. We've talked about he's pushed all the right buttons in the past. 
but it feels like these last couple of weeks, the buttons that he's been pushing, like everything's been going wrong. It doesn't help that the bullpen refuses to throw strikes as well. Yeah, refusing to throw strikes is one thing. And also, I think the Diaz usage is starting to get a little bit strange. I'm not like troubled by it because I still, I don't know. Like it seems like over the last month, he's been pitching the best he has all year. Yes. And then in that same time, we have found every excuse. You okay? What are you looking uh, for? It's, it's raining so hard right really? now. It's not, it's not raining by me. It is torrential downpour right now in Astoria. I can huh. hear it. It's like puddled up on my uh, my balcony. And I'm like, is it going to get above the door thing? <laughs> like, I'm so by bone dry outside the window right now in Brooklyn. But it's, it's, it's insane. Diaz, in the month of August, has only had one save opportunity. Just one. And he's only made five, four appearances this month in total. 18 it's days insane. he's made four appearances. Diaz pitched. He pitched on Thursday in the loss to the A's. He pitched on Tuesday in the loss to the A's. He pitched last Wednesday, got a save in Colorado. That was August 7th. And then he pitched that Monday game. He pitched the ninth inning in the game we're winning by a lot in St. Louis. And then before so that, like, it was it was Tuesday the 30th against the Twins and Thursday the 25th against the Braves in the extra inning game that we won, that we were at. Yes. That game. So that's only seven. That's only six appearances Redmond Diaz since July 25th. And I'm like, that. that's where I was in the eighth inning was, okay, like I, I like Phil Maton. He's been one of our better relievers this year, like no doubt. The, it's not an issue of like should have, don't go to Phil Maton. But it felt like in what we're, that, that was a save situation, essentially, that eighth inning. Or that, yeah, ninth inning, whatever it was. Eighth inning, eighth inning. Ninth inning, eighth inning. Eighth inning. Eighth inning. No, why not yeah, go to Diaz? Inning. Yeah, eighth why inning. not go to Diaz? Because those outs were the most important ones there. It just, it felt a little bit weird. I haven't been loving the decision-making recently in the bullpen. Part of the problem is that Adam Adovino is still on this team. Part Bad. of the problem is that dead Neil Nunez is nowhere to be found. Where is he? But that shouldn't be this big of a problem. And I know, just, but I'm I'm just saying, like, I listen, the Daniel Nunez thing, that's more of a me. Like, where when is he coming back? Because I miss him. Because he was so damn good. He was our fire man. He was incredible. That's more of a like, I wish he was here so we could go to him. He was so good. But pushing it with Reed Garrett a little bit longer when he's been shaky since coming back from the IL and was shaky before it. Like he's he needs to get right. You could have gotten him out of that appearance with like a good good outing from Reed Garrett. And I think that would have been big. And in the eighth inning, Reed Garrett walks Xavier Edwards to lead off the end. Get inning. him out. Get him out. That's it. Like you Take can't be out. in it. You can't be in after that happens. He got the strikeout Jake Berger. Then again, he walks Jonah Bride. And then after he walks Jonah Bride again, he walks Jesus Sanchez. So I'm yeah. thinking, like, how what else does he have to do to get taken out of this game? Like, yeah. how can this still be happening? And then you have to kind of double down, move back on it with again the fact that he has not been using Diaz aggressively. No. And this has been specifically the same amount of time since Daniel Nunez went out. So I think in Mendoza's mind, he's like, okay, he's my only guy who I know can pitch in the ninth inning. So I have to save him for the ninth inning. But the flip side of that is that right now, just push comes to shove. Diaz and Budo are the only guys bullpen that can miss a bat. That was a crazy bolt of lightning in your back. Oh, shit. Did you hear that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whoa. Live on the Mets Up podcast, Holy the weather crap. system moving through Astoria. And you have no rain. <laughs> None. Dry. We live like five miles away from each other. I think it's like four and a half. Yeah, it's in the nuts. straight line. But I think that this is making Mendoza too tight with Diaz. Whereas yes. the game like today where you know that Budo's not available because he just threw the, another one coming. He just threw the... You were drinking a Coca-Cola? Yeah, I, I, I treat myself to a soda once a month. And I was like... <laughs> I, I woke up, I was like, I can use a Coca-Cola today. It's, I've Original been keeping taste. It a, I've been keeping an emergency Sprite in my fridge for a special occasion. That's I don't know when. Once a month. I don't know when. I don't know when. You when. get the You're like, I gotta have a little soda pop. Yeah. Usually I do it for the Arizona green tea. I mean, I would say no free ads, but I mean, I'll do some free ads for Arizona green tea. Anything they ever need. Anything. Literally ever. But Budo, as the only other guy in bullpen can miss bats, he's not available. He He's thrown four innings this week in games that were nowhere closer than four runs, which yeah. I didn't dislike the way he was used on Friday because like, just end the game, shut the door, Correct. I don't care, yeah. get out of this, no, no more bullpen usage, and Severino helps you out with that again, but it's just like you, you've you now let, you left this series and you didn't use your, your number one bullet. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, 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 like you, and is Diaz is Diaz only a ninth inning guy? Is there something we don't know like that is going on? Because he, I don't think so. He, I know it's different coming back from the injury, whatever, but like he's done multiple outs. I think he's done multiple outs this year or multiple innings this year. So it's like, I don't, I don't know why, like you said, you're saving that bullet when the Mets realistically need to win every single game they possibly can. Diaz has only thrown multiple innings once since July 9th. Okay. But he's also only pitched what, like six times since then? <laughs> like, he's only, he's only done it three total times this year. Okay. So, but also here's the other thing is that I would be fine 
if Diaz literally just got the last two outs in that eighth inning. Yes, and then Maton just comes in for a clean ninth against the bottom of the Marlins lineup. You know what I mean? Like that, I don't think that's the worst thing either. Like I think you should be more willing and more accepting to use your best relief yeah. pitcher in the most tense situation rather than the ninth inning. Because it's just that's just that's just what happened. I guess you never like it's hard to like pinpoint the spot in this Marlins line to be like, I have to make sure this spot in the lineup doesn't kill me. Because they all kind of suck. Everyone sucks, basically one through nine, besides Jake Berger, who leads all major and league Xavier baseball Edwards. and home and home runs. Xavier Edwards is a pretty fun ball player, besides getting picked off. Which yes. I guess I don't know. That was pretty stupid to do that twice in one game and three times in a series. That was unbelievable, honestly. Kept saved the game for us. But it's just a little tight. A little tight decision making from Mendoza here. A little too tight. And it, you leave this game being like, man. If Edwin Diaz came in instead of Phil Maton, you might have won. These are things that it feels like first time manager learning curve a little bit here. Totally. That's why I'm not like games. I'm not cruising. I'm like, Carlos Mendoza is not fit yeah, for the yeah. job. No, it's just I don't know. It's the kind of things, yeah, he might he might figure out a little bit better. Maybe someone gets in his ear later is like from like the analytics department. It's like, you know, like the Diaz there. That, and that. again, I I do think this is also a huge part of and I hate to keep just shitting on Adam Adovino, but he just can't be on this team anymore. <laughs> he has he has no purpose. Like his only purpose is mop up duty. And for a team that like needs to win games and has shaky pitching, especially in the bullpen, you need to be able to have every single arm available to you in a game to win. And Adam Adovino will simply not be in a game that's closer than four or five runs. Yeah, it's just again all these little tiny, little tiny things about the roster just keep coming back and keep cementing the fact that this is a five hundred team. Yes, and this is not a ten games over five hundred team. So it's, it's maybe a five game over five hundred team, but just not a ten game over five hundred team. And that's just simply probably it. Yeah, that sucked. Really bad taste. That being said, the rest of the series was actually really good. Friday yeah. and Saturday night were awesome. Uh, let's talk about Severino because so he cool. was phenomenal, and I loved the emotion that he showed. Rain just started. Rain, rain just started. All right. It's reached nice. Brooklyn. Very good. <laughs> we have what? Rain has touched down in Brooklyn. But yeah, Severino was incredible. Uh, I love the emotion he was showing. I really thought that that was just a good sign for the Mets in general to show that kind of emotion and passion. Shout out to Francisco Lindor for convincing Carlos Mendoza to let Severino go the full game because apparently he wasn't going to let him, which is also really funny to think about now with how Sunday went. And Mendoza also said that the the crowd made him do it too, where it's like, all right, well, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe don't say that one. <laughs> yeah, maybe focus up on these decisions a little bit. But yeah, it was, it was just cool to see that moment. We had some friends at the game who said the energy and City Field was just amazing. You could feel it on television. Yep. Because like, guys, the Mets haven't thrown a complete game shutout since. You know when, Mark? Complete game shutout. I mean, it's got to be DeGrom. Yeah, what's DeGrom? Do we know who he was playing? Can I, yeah, can I make... Was it going to be DeGrom against the Braves? No. Okay, who was it? It was the that Degrom Nationals Friday game, to fifteen oh. strikeouts. Oh, yeah, it was a good one. That was a yeah, it was a really good one. God, I, I missed Jacob Degrom. I know. I, I tweeted last night again. <laughs> it's messed up, boys. Every third weekend, we'll tweet a Jacob Degrom meme at like one o'clock <laughs> in the morning on Friday or Saturday. But it was funny. I tweeted that, and a couple of the Mets people like took that tweet and like made their own variations of it. But that's fine. That's how Twitter works. And then. Before Degrom, the last two complete game shoutouts by the Mets were Mass and Syndergaard to give you how 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 rarely these things happen. Yikes! Yeah, so it was twelve hundred twelve days exactly from Degrom's complete game shoutout to Severino's complete game shoutout, and it was just it was cool that I don't know dude, we don't have a bunch of these anymore. That's like one of the coolest things in sports. Also, that was the first time Severino went over a hundred pitches since June twenty third. Yep. which is a really long time, and that was that Sunday night game. That was the Edwin Diaz game, 10 strikeouts against the Cubs. This is also another game where Severino threw more than 15% sweepers, and when he does that, he is good. He's awesome. Fast, yeah, the fastball's up to 99. Like, it's just just really good season for a pitcher who seemed to work really, really hard to get back to this point, and nice to see this paying off for him. And from a larger scope, zoning out of the 2024 season as a whole, really good for the Mets as a team. Now that could be a landing spot for guys yes. similar to Severino, 100%. Manaya. They're seeing yes. this going. I Proof. can go to the Mets. One they year. will they will fix me for a year, and I will be able to hit free agency and get more the money. contract that I want with more money. That's yeah. really big on the on the bigger scale of things. Looking past the 2024 season. I know you're not a Walker Bueller guy, but like that's something that oh, I'm no. like, oh, I'm Walker Bueller for this. Okay, yeah, like a Walker Bueller for this. One for twelve, like, yeah. That would be that could be the Severino next year. We're thinking way ahead, but that's really cool from a organizational standpoint. Yeah, it's 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 like to use a colloquial term, it's proof in the pudding. There it like, is. We can we can come here and help you fix your pitcher. Like you will make more money after you spend one year like with the Mets pitching facility, which is great. That's great. And also again, same thing with Manaya, who's just become a, a seven inning god so after Ever I accuse him seven. of being a five and dive. I think he has the most seven inning appearances in baseball since the beginning of June. <laughs> like five times. Like all this guy does is throw seven innings, much to my dismay. But awesome. Great. And again, like this is 
we've said a lot of times this year that these are the best two pitchers in this rotation, but the rotation still lacks a true stopper. So then even more falls into these guys, especially against these bad teams, to stop the bleeding, which they had to do on Friday because things were feeling really bad after Thursday. And they did. Both pitched great games. All And Paul Blackburn, again, shout out Paul Blackburn, third quality star as a Met. Shame we didn't get to be in attendance for the first quality star in the building, but... No. Three out of four games, quality star for Paul Blackburn. What else could you ask for? Not much. Really not much. It was good to see him bounce back after that rough start against the A's. Uh, he just did a good job. Did you think he should have came out for the seventh? Well, I mean, in hindsight, yeah. No, but, but in the moment, in the moment, what did you think? You were fine with it? In the moment, I was I was totally okay with it just to give these guys clean innings because I don't want sure. these relievers to have that many not clean innings. Again, they're not very we good. walk everybody. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but he was cruising. He was looking really good. The, the, again, that was the third straight start, fourth start with the Mets where the color's been the primary pitch. That only happened twice all year or once all year in the nine starts with the A's. So we may, again, similar to the Severino thing. Like, we here's in the pitcher. We can identify a change. We can make an adjustment, and we will make you better. That's something yeah. that every, every pitcher in the league will notice. Also, another tip that Severino I missed, he threw his fastest fastball in the game in the ninth inning at 98.6 miles an hour. That's awesome. That's sick. Yeah. That's that's for him, that's sick for him, too. He's going, money, money, please. Yeah. <laughs> you know what else is sick? Francisco Lindor. This mm -hmm. guy is just so awesome. The numbers keep getting better and better and better. And right now, if you look at the live leaderboards for F4 <laughs> in the National League, sitting at number one. Francisco Lindor has been the most valuable player in the National League this season. He is the fifth most valuable player in all of Major League Baseball. Again, behind Bobby Wood Jr., Aaron Judge, Juan Soto, and Gunnar Henderson, who are all competing for the MVP. And if it wasn't for Aaron Judge, those three guys would be a really, really tough pick between the three there. Yeah. It's pretty pretty incredible what Lindor has been able to do this year. He's got WRC plus after Sunday's game at 129. The average is up to 264, slugging 470. Like he's just <laughs> he's so damn good. It's crazy. I've been telling you, I think this is the best season of his career. But you keep not listening to me. I didn't. You have. I said it then. I haven't said <laughs> it recently. Don't, that was a old, a week ago. Take. <laughs> Yeah, Lindor's riding a 12-game hitting streak right now. For the batting average people, the batting average is up to 264, yeah. which is crazy. He's also one of only two players in baseball this year, which is just me doing a really stupid stat, but it just works with yeah. 20 homers, 20 steals, 30 doubles, 70 RBIs. It's just Lindor and Bobby Witt Jr. And weirdly, there's three guys very close to those numbers. Shohei Otani's literally one double away. So I just that was like perfect. <laughs> nice. Great. I'm so happy about that. Hell yeah. Um, Jose Ramirez, I think, was three doubles away. And weirdly, Spencer Steer. Was two home was two doubles away at that and like maybe three RBIs. He has twenty stolen bases. Yeah, he's having an amazing season, Spencer what? Steer. Fancy fancy baseball MVP, truthfully. Wow, Spencer Steer, Unreal have season. a year. Love, love Spencer Steer. But another thing that's funny about Slendor stuff is that it keeps bringing war, especially Fangraphs war, back into the spectrum of like my, of baseball talk. And our boy Addison, Yankees world, good follow on baseball Twitter. He loves Slendor. He doesn't understand yes. the, the hate he gets from Mets fans and King. baseball fans. And uh. He was saying that, like the top, he like did the oh my god, Francisco Lindor officially most F one in the National League, and people were responding like, "This is just proof that war is a useless stat." He was like, "What do you mean?" Like, can someone explain, explain why this? Because he was like, "I watch Francisco Lindor every day. No way he's one of the best players in the National League." It's like, "All right, you're a fucking idiot." And then, but, uh, other funny thing that happened off this, the Mets main has seen all this talk, and they did the tweet of your F four lead. Your no, they said your war leader in the National League with the clip of him having the the single today. Nice. They stipulate F war because that's that there's two different wars. One B war from baseball reference, one's F war from fan graphs. He's not the leader in the other one. So it's like no. interesting. Yeah, that's that's a little a little touch for Mets Met Socials to be a little be a little sharper to the baseball analytics. The conversation of like watching him play and saying he's not one of the best players too is like I don't think you are watching shit. him play because yeah, I watch him every watching. single night and I'm like wow best. I'm again. I'm so happy this guy's here for like another seven, eight years. This is great. He's gonna go to Cooperstown with the fucking Mets hat. It's sick. It's sick. It's one of the we're best contracts. One of the best contracts in baseball. We're literally gonna retire this guy's jersey. It's crazy. He's gonna. He's Budget. gonna. He's probably gonna be the best Mets player ever. There's a chance he's he's besides the most Tom Seaver. Besides Tom Seaver, most productive Mets position player ever. Yes. Yeah, because I I still don't think he'll be he'll never he'll never be the best. He can, no, he won't be Tom Seaver. Seaver but Seaver and Degrom are better which yeah, is yeah. All, we find we talk about the ground every episode but as far as the production he's also gonna be the first guy i think in like 12 15 years to have it uh, someone who commented in my tweet today rob dph a fancy baseball god he um he's gonna be the first guy since i think it was soriano or braun to have to go 30 30 back to back years wow yeah that's, that's huge pretty, like he's so sick. fucking good <laughs> he's so good everything about him is crazy good like, like, and this thing that sucks is that if this other if the rest of the team was actually balling right now we are basically a playoffs by the way from him seriously 
seriously make a push for the MVP. Yes. Like, that, that's kind of the difference. Like they, if he, if we don't make the playoffs, he can't win the MVP, no. which is the same reason Elliot De La Cruz might be the most valuable player in the National League. He also probably can't win the MVP. So it's probably going to come down to Shohei or Cattell, whoever just has the better month, or I guess Lindor. If whoever gets hot get in September, five. that's really all yeah. it comes down to. Yeah, true. Like Lindor, Lindor could go blazing hot. He could just take the MVP and also drive the Mets to the playoffs. Yeah. That's possible. And that could have happened if that fucking ball would have actually dropped in the ninth inning. Christian Pache that's shouldn't even part. be in the fucking majors. God damn it. Like Christian Pache is now he's in um he's in stage two of the Robles seven steps seven stages to to being a what does it make him a rat fuck? It doesn't. He's not good enough to okay. be. I don't know. It's also it's not. It's, this isn't a big enough game. If this game was in a month and that happened, and we lose a game on September eighteenth. That put that keeps us two games out of the wild card. Then because that's ends on Giarte. Exactly. That's a rat. Fuck. Yes. He's a, he's officially on rat fuck watch though. Yeah. Rf Rfw. Rfw. Rat fuck watch. Christian Pache is an Rfw, but. I guess that's the end of the series, really. I don't know what else to say. It was nice to see Nimmo get hot, but all that got pulled away from us, taken away by the fact that Suck. he had to leave the game on Sunday. Wait, which... why is he getting an MRI tomorrow as well? Why is there not an MRI today? I didn't understand that. Tim Healy tweeted it out, like, <laughs> Brandon Nimmo get an MRI tomorrow. I'm like, it's a fucking hospital. They're open 24-7. <laughs> he can't go today? Is there something I don't know about modern medicine where it's like, the injury happened today, can't look at it today, we got to look at it tomorrow? I don't know. Maybe, like, maybe, that means like, he's not maybe something about like maybe something about like swelling and settling, or may, or maybe there's something about like the Mets just probably have another fan engagement event tonight that maybe Nimmo has to be at. Yeah, I don't know who the fucking knows, but yeah, nice that I don't know. Nice that we just won a series, but it just sucks that we couldn't sweep. Yeah, it does suck that we couldn't sweep. Uh, that being said, a lot of baseball ahead. A lot of baseball ahead. Two games out. Braves won today, so we're still two games back on them, which is unfortunate. We'll love to gain some ground. But, of course, when we win, the Braves win. When we lose, the Braves win. That's just kind of how it rolls. Next series, Baltimore Orioles. Before we go into previewing that, we do have some media marvels, though, right? Yeah, I put down a couple. and Let me know if you if you can think of any, too. But one we missed from Thursday, um, just the, the the continued fallout of the Hawk Tua girl throwing out the first pitch. Um, I, I tweeted it. My, my 71-year-old uncle asked me at the wedding I was at on Friday. He was like, who is this girl? What is she famous for? I was like, do you really want to know? He was like, yeah, he's uh, – Mark's met my Uncle Lou. He's a character for Legend. sure. Legend. Um, yeah, he's – He's he's a baseball encyclopedia, truthfully. He he was telling me who pitched the games of the nineteen seventy three World Series at the same weather. And we were going <laughs> like he was going getting for inning. It was he's he's unbelievable. But um I said, Do you really want to know who she's famous for? He was like, what I don't know who she is. He's seventy one. He's I go, uh she went viral for talking about blowjobs on camera. And he went, What? And he like his whole body flung back and he and he screamed and he, like his knee buckled a little bit. So yeah, and again, also I forgot. That that was on camp day. The Mets, Mets did day. that. Yeah. So the Mets had the day that they advertised for children to come, and then for oh, for the first pitch, they threw the girl who was famous for giving head. Spitting so that dicks. was yeah. So that was a good one. But again, fallout from that, we missed it. Our friend Tim Healy had a great clap back to Keith Olbermann, because Who's one Keith of the Olbermann, worst Twitter users on the planet. And it's a shame because he was one of the goats of sports media all time, and now he's become this just insufferable curmudgeonly shit yeah. to, for lack of a better term uh he took a screenshot of tim healy's tweet about the hawk to a girl and then posted that and saying i can't believe the mess did this and tim healy response he was like you couldn't just quote tweet me <laughs> like, you did so much more work to get this screenshot posted you cut, instead you crop. Of, yeah like i you don't want me to get engagement so bad that you took like four extra steps of doing this so keith Olbermann, that's one of our media marvels that's just such a strange petty move another one that was huge huge topic discussion similarly with my dad and my uncles and my cousins this wedding on um <laughs> on Saturday, Friday, Aaron Judge is 300th home run last week. 300th yeah. home run of his career. Fastest player in terms of at bats ever to reach 300 home runs, which is really cool. Aaron yes. Judge is an amazing player. Aaron Judge is putting together like the first, the first half, first third of a true Hall of Fame career. He's yes. that good. But it was only 300th home run. 300th home run in baseball history is not exactly. It's not exactly a marvel. We don't remember. I don't remember where I was for other players' 300th home runs. Okay, and I see this what was, you're saying now because I was like, I don't like to take, but I see what you're saying. Listen, and this was on the front page of the Daily News in the New York Post. Aaron Judge has 300th home run. Get the fuck out of here with the front page of the paper for the 300th home run. You kidding me? Slow news day. Slow news day. It's only baseball. I during guess. This summer. But I guess they yeah, can't talk about Hawk Tua girl anymore. But yeah, he. Uh, I mean, the only reason I'll clap back on that is he is the fastest player to ever hit 300 home runs. So that totally. I think is an accomplishment. Like considering, I'm not saying it's not an accomplishment. Yeah, but. I think that's worthy of it. But yeah, it's kind of like the the Aaron Judge hitting 60. Three home runs or whatever it was. It's like, yeah, oh, the eighth seven, most ever in a major yeah, league season. Eighth or seventh most ever in a season. He's really good, though. No Aaron Judge. He's amazing. I, yeah, Aaron this is just more uh, taking shots at that. I thought it was also funny, too. The Yankees posted about it on their Instagram. And seeing the Yankee fan mutants in the comment section be like, and don't forget, he missed a bunch of games, too. 
And it's like, <laughs> no, idiot. It's the least amount of games, not seasons. I think it was that like, bad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, you can lead the horse to the water, but you can't make him drink with Yankee yeah. fans. But like, he, I just, I, and he had a shortened season. I'm like, nope, that, just, does, that doesn't matter. And I get it, though, because we're, we're trying so hard, like baseball is, for Aaron Judge to be like the guy, the, the star, face. the face. And I think it's fully done. Like MLB Network did their rankings on Friday of the faces of baseball, and they had Judge over Otani. They also thought it was really funny that number three, they had Bobby Witt Jr. Yes. And I think, again, I, I love Bobby Witt Jr. I hope he can become one of the faces of baseball because he's one of the most exciting baseball players. Maybe he was four and Ellie was three or flip flop some there. I think he was but, four. Yeah. If. And again, I say this as someone who is a devout baseball fan and, and, a, and, a, and a, dev- a lover of living in New York City. If you put Bobby Wood Jr. on on, on, f- on Fifth Avenue and 34th Street and you told him to walk north until you got to Central Park 45 minutes an hour, how many people do you think would stop him and recognize him? It's a good chance you could put him in a full uniform and nobody would stop him. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, think, I think it would be less than six. Like, really, he could walk in a straight line Manhattan for one hour. I don't think anybody picked their head up. Now, that being said, New York City, great. The baseball fans are great. The whole city, the city as a whole, bad, bad sports recognition. Like, if you're not a Nick, a New York Nick player, they might have some di- difficulty identifying you. Like, I don't know how many foot. I don't know if they could identify Aaron Rodgers. A lot of these people, like, no, you can identify Aaron Rodgers because he's that much. Garrett of a star, Wilson. But- I don't know if they do identify Garrett Wilson. Definitely not. Malik Neighbors, no chance. No Again, shot, like yeah. Bobby Wood Jr., shortstop for the Kansas City Royals, literally no chance. No He's going to be one of the exciting, most exciting baseball players any of us see in our lives. But I just thought that was funny. It's not a medium world. It was just like, I think he, I agree, like maybe in terms of the rest of the league, but I don't know how many players in Major League Baseball that aren't even on the Mets or Yankees. And even some that are in the Mets and Yankees the, would ever get noticed. The other thing that's difficult with like this face of the MLB thing too is it's it's so like nonsense because there's like no actual like real face of Major League Baseball. It is Judge and Otani right now. Those are the two big names. Bryce Harper is probably the, one of the most recognizable players as well. Like he's not going to go on that faces of MLB list, but in yeah. terms of like baseball players that are well known, Bryce Harper is without a doubt in the top five. Like it's not even close. It's also funny. We've named all of these players and we still don't have one with a World Series ring. That's true. Yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah. Aaron Judge has never even been to the World Series. No, he's never. Aaron Judge has never beaten a team not from the AL Central in the playoffs. Yeah. That's good. That's true. Yeah. Last time, just forget trivia for you guys. Last time the Yankees beat a team not from the AL Central in the playoffs, it was Buck Show Walters Orioles in 2013 (laughs) (laughs) or 2012, something like that. He's been fired twice since then. And that was the last time the Yankees won a series against a team that wasn't the Twins or Guardians. Last media marvel we have the uh, minor league baseball main account <laughs> tweeted out Brett Beatty like what the fuck I <laughs> think five, five homers in eight games it was like Mets minor league second baseman Brett Beatty was fifth home run in eight games I just saw it and I laughed September call ups we get how many two now in the September call ups two yeah so pitcher I think it's one hitter one pitcher so it's gonna be Brett Beatty right I'm assuming he's gonna get called up I don't you think the Mets might need an outfielder more than an infielder right now well it depends what Brandon Nimmo's got going on I guess yeah Starling Marte like, did come back by the way we didn't talk about that back. Marte he hit the ball hard a couple times hit the ball hard a couple times and in the sixth inning they pulled him for defense because defense is that bad <laughs> and Harrison Bader came up in the line spot and promptly struck out so yeah. even as my, Marte is five steps or ten steps back always for Starling fucking Marte but oh my last media marvel I think Anthony Record might have CTE he just like, <laughs> like one of the worst performances ever the guy thinks or speaks then thinks he said that Shohei Otani is not your average DH he's pitching this year that did, that's untrue not hasn't thrown a pitch this season he was like you know <laughs> talking about this MVP talk Shohei Otani is not just a DH he can pitch too he hasn't done it this year that has nothing to do with why he's so good this season uh, oh I thought that God. was funny and he just like was talking about all these like different things he was talking about that the Mets should just like walk Jesus Sanchez when Reed Garrett walked him later he's like you gotta act like there's an open base but so you want to put the tying run 90 feet closer in scoring position that doesn't make any sense if he was on second base already yes but you don't want to move the guy from first to second base for free this is why you got to do the backdoor loophole, and I got the MLB TV stream, and I, you can sync it up with Howie and Keith Radner. Which, which uh, you know, you can just click that on MLB TV, right? You don't have to sync it up yeah. yourself. Okay. No, no, okay. I, I clicked on MLB TV. That's what I mean. That was what yeah. I mean by syncing. Yeah. When you I said that, wait. I did it. I was like, this is incredible. This is so much better. It is weird though. So good to hear Howie and watching the game. Like I that's know, like a is. bizarre feeling. Because he's describing everything so damn well, but I um. I did a lot of Howie this weekend, so I was just moving around a lot. Uh, him and him, and Keith Rabbit were having such a good time on on Saturday. There were there were so many Seinfeld references between two guys who were like forty years apart in age. It was it was a beautiful thing for New oh, York culture. Fill me in. What was the LeBron hate today by Howie? Oh, he just made a <laughs> you made the comment where um oh what were they talking about? Was it Manaya? Was it it was someone in the Mets? I can't remember what story they were telling. Or maybe even back in the day, it may have been a right, it may have been DeGrom, it, may, it could have even been at Kareem Pool, I don't remember. But just saying about how someone said like it was this amazing moment that like they had like 
a conversation talking with one of the players on the team. And then he called out LeBron because there was that video went viral last week of that little kid like going, LeBron, LeBron, can I take a picture with you? Like after the medal ceremony, LeBron literally pretending the kid did not exist and walking past him. <laughs> and he was like, you just take, can't take a picture with the kid? Come on. Which is, that was a good, good old man take, which I liked. Legend. Legend. How he's the best. All right, let's go ahead and preview this Baltimore Orioles series. First and only time we will be playing them this year. And this Baltimore Orioles team, as you guys know, if you've been watching any Stacked. ball, which I assume, uh, they are arguably the best team in baseball. They are very, very good. This offense is absolutely loaded. They do everything well. Is it, What's the flaw with this team? Anything? Um, The bottom of the order hasn't been hitting as much recently. They've just kind of hit a swoon. Gunnar Henderson, Adley Rushman started out the season as two of the best players in baseball. Adley today, on, on Sunday, his first home run in a month. Whoa. Which was pretty yeah, pretty serious. And they, um, I don't know, the pitching, again, just comes back to mostly being good, not great. They shuffled their rotation and went to a six-man, so now we're going to totally miss Corbin Burns in this That's series. Huge. Corbin Burns also had the worst start of his major career on Saturday. He sunk me in a fantasy matchup, which is brutal. And then it's just, it's a lot of, with also with Grayson Rodriguez going down, Kyle Bradish being out for the year, it is a very unspectacular rotation relative to how much talent is on the rest of this team. True, yeah. I'd say. Who's, what are the pitching matchups? We're going to get what? Eflin? Are we getting Trevor pitching Rogers? Ma- pitching matchups this series. So Monday night, 7 o'clock. We're also going to be dealing with some rain in New York Monday. So we don't know if this game's going to happen. We could do a double dip on Tuesday. We could do a day game before. Softball. Wow. That could be something that we 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 talk about here. But uh Ace off, David Peterson versus Trevor Rogers. I'm kidding. It's the opposite of an ace off. That's, That's a slog. Almost as far from an ace off as you're gonna get. Tuesday evening, Hold not on. an ace off. <laughs> no, <I'm laughs> Hold my beer, wait for this next one. <laughs> Jose Quintana, Dean Kramer. And then Wednesday matinee, one Ace-off. o'clock game. This will be a good one, actually. It's Manaya versus Zeflin. This is one I also maybe would like to go to if we can. Dude, a one o'clock game, tonight. come back to Astoria, re- record. Oh, you gotta work though. I work at night. I work at seven. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe maybe okay. we'll do an in person on Wednesday. Yeah, we could pull that off. And then so, like you you see those three pitchers. Like Zach Elflin, a lot of respect. He's one of he's one of the top 30, 35 pitchers in baseball. He's just as steady as, as steady as they come. But Kramer and Trevor Rogers, they're both not pitching well. They're pitching worse of late. Trevor Rogers stinks. Maybe he'll walk into City Field. He'll just like he'll just do the Thanos and all his powers will come back <laughs> in twenty twenty one from when he went toe to toe Jacob Degrom and beat him. But as as good as this lineup is, that's how gettable their pitching is. Yeah, uh, fun fact. I, have I told the Zach Eflin story about how I chirped him in spring training when he was with the Phillies, like right before he got good? Uh, I no. think it was like 2018 spring training with the Phillies. This was right before they found out that like weird knee thing that he had going on. And that's, that's when like Eflin threw like 88. Like he couldn't throw anything <laughs> hard at all. And I'm behind him in the bullpen being a little shit, just chirping him. I'm like, Gas, heat, heat him up, heat him up. Like, what are you pumping, 88, brother? Like, just giving him a ton of shit. Since then, he's been incredible. He's been really, really good. So, glad to see that uh, at least that had, didn't come with the Phillies, all these uh, these good performances for him, necessarily. I never knew that story. Zach Eflin's one of the reasons I even started making baseball content, because I read that story about him. It was around 2018, similarly. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, this guy, he basically had a, a degenerative condition in his knees where he didn't know how – he couldn't extend them all the way. Yes. So he couldn't actually fully follow through. And when he finished pitch, like, his every pitch, his back was, like, at a 45-degree angle. He couldn't, like, bend and get into it. So then he got, the like, the, the procedure on them. He picked up, like, five hours on his fastball one offseason. I was like, I fucking love this guy. I, I've had him on every fantasy team since then. I just – he's a dog. He's a worker. I wish the Mets would have signed him. I double wish the Mets would have just traded for him. But yeah. alas, uh, another guy very interesting that the um, that the Orioles traded for the trade deadline. A favorite of of yours, a favorite of mine, just because I like when players leave the Phillies or any team I hate and get better afterward. Sir Anthony Dominguez has been a menace for the Baltimore Orioles in the three weeks, three and a half weeks since they acquired him. He already has fully become the closer. On this team, he's uh, he's unseated Craig Kimbrell. He has saves in his last three appearances where Kimbrell doesn't have one in a week and a half. And he, in 10 innings with the Orioles, he has 13 strikeouts. He's given up just two earned runs on two solo homers. He's a monster. I wasn't really sure why the Phillies gave him up. I know their bullpen's been pretty good. They don't necessarily, like, I guess need it. I don't know. It felt weird that they got rid of him so quickly because Dominguez has always, always had stuff. And that's not a, I guess, because he's a free agent. I don't, it felt weird, but good pickup for the Orioles because he's been very good. Incredibly good. Who, who'd they get for him? Do you remember? I'll tell you, they got Austin Hayes. So I guess oh. that's oh. why. I think that's worth it. Yeah, probably. You know what? For the Phillies, you need Maybe an outfielder more. more than that. Yeah. yeah. But Dominguez is awesome. Um, other guys in that bullpen who are crazy, Yenier Cano, who they famously acquired for, um, I think it was for Jorge Lopez two years ago, the trade deadline, yes. who Jorge Lopez is now. Officially the closer on the Cubs, which is, <laughs> it's just really funny. He got two saves in the last couple of days. So, um, Cano's amazing. They had, he just throws a demon sinker. 
Cionel Perez is a good reliever. Uh, who else I got in that pen? I'm Craig Kimbrell. Right Kimbrell, but Ki- Kimbrell's been down recently. He's not been. He's not been. He's not been the guy. He's not been himself. I guess he has been himself, but that's just the four year old version of himself. Doesn't Birch Smith throw like a hundred? I probably if he's in their bullpen. They're also they're they're trying to reclamation with Gregory Soto. There's a little bit more of a lift than Sir Anthony Dominguez. That's your boy, Mark Gregory I, Soto. I but... hit that one out of the park. Everyone was applauding the <laughs> Phillies when they traded this guy. I'm like, he sucks. Have you not watched this guy pitch for the Tigers? This guy stinks. He's gonna shut us down this series. That's for sure. For sure. And then otherwise, I mean, Anthony Santander is one of the crazy stories in baseball. He's got 36 yeah. homers. It's like I think they're in the league. Contract Cole here. Ka- yeah, Cole Cowder's having an awesome rookie year. He's been one of the most valuable rookies in the American League. Jackson Holiday's back up, and he's actually hitting this time around. They traded for Eloy Jimenez, who out of the doldrums of the South Side of Chicago looks re- reborn as a baseball player. Uh, we're going to see old friend James McCann this series. Yes. I'm sure a lot of Mets fans really miss him. I'm sure he's going to get a very a very warm reception from the Shoot. City Field faith. So I can't. There's no doubt. Did you get a video? I think he definitely gets a video. That's, it's going to be so fucking funny. That's disgusting if they make a James McCann video. That's disgusting. I think it's good for the memes. I think they're going to try and make it totally seriously. But he, um, nice note. On Sunday, he got his 10-year, 10-year service. Good time. for James McCann. James McCann getting the pension. Got a nice family. Good. He was a good guy. He just he just got signed to a contract that he couldn't play up to. Shout out to when I uh, tweeted out "Smell you later, loser!" After he got traded, <laughs> and I got I got, got uh, reprimanded. I got reprimanded by the New York Mets. They're like, "You can't tweet that." I was like, "Why? He's gone." That was right after you were given to tweeting out gambling tips about Mets home runs. Yeah, I, I, had, a, I had can't a do this week. either. <laughs> but. This Orioles team is good. They're they're a very deep team. They have star power in the top. They have part pitchers. Again, I, these guys are not that good, but they're going to keep them in the game, and the bullpen's very good behind them. It's a, it's a solid baseball team, but it's just a chance right now where, similar to that twin series, like let's play up some competition and let's fucking win baseball games against a good team. You see what they did with Kobe Mayo, right? Sent him down. Sent him down. He wasn't really playing that well, but sent him down. You know what that does, though? Keeps his oh. rookie eligibility for next year. He's going to start the year at third base or first base, whatever they decide. He's going to win rookie of the year. They're going to get another extra draft pick like they did with Gunner. I think Holiday also is not is not. He's on the. He could still be a rookie next 100 year. Hundred plate appearances. I, he's done. Oh, here he has it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, never mind. I thought it was 150. But I mean, he's going to get there. Yeah. They. Got, I mean, you have to play that game. Like, especially if you have a rookie that's that good. Like, I don't. I don't hate them doing that. Which is again why maybe Drew Gilbert comes up instead of Brett Bailey because you can get the at bats and can still be a rookie next year. Yes. But. I think I saw like off this Orioles series, but then everyone, it gets crazy after the Orioles series because these are three games against a good team. And then we go out West for four games against the Padres, three games against the Diamondbacks. This is the 10 game series that will fully define the season. We'll, we'll know in the next 11 days what's going to happen with this team. That's yeah. it. We, or, we totally will. Or you win like four of seven and you're exactly <laughs> where you are. Like there's yeah. also a world where the Mets are two games out. After the Diamondback series, yeah, true. Like, they just they just go five and five in these ten games. Yeah, you're like, oh wow, yeah. uh, nothing, nothing has happened, nothing's changed, and that's why you gotta uh, love baseball. It's gonna be the longest like six weeks to end the season that we've we've had in a while, which is good and bad. Is can I say that it's good because I love that we're at least in a playoff contention, but bad because I don't know if I can actually physically hold it. I know uh, the woman who cuts my hair took a, ch- took a chunk out of my head. If you're gonna watch on YouTube here, <laughs> um. But can't, I, I can't keep pulling out my hair watching these games. They're so tight, every single one. I pulled out some of my own hair the other day. I gave myself a little haircut it's on, an, Friday, that's on Thursday. That's my, my, bar, my barber had a baby. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, a loyal, I'm loyal to my hair cutter. Shout out Dana. She's the goat. So I'm not going to let anyone own else touch this. I'm like, not letting anyone else touch this hair besides hair. It looks fine. You told me it looked good. Isn't that what Charlie does? And it's always sunny. Isn't, doesn't he cut his own it's very hair? very different. This is very different. I can read. That's a huge difference between me and Charlie. I don't eat cat food. But it just cleaned up the neck. I trimmed the sides off. It was, it was good. It is, if you didn't say anything, I would have never known. Exactly. So, that's all that matters. Applaud so, to you. Yeah, applaud to you. Hit, hit, cutting your own hair is like like your core, your cornerbacks in your favorite football team. Like I, I just don't want to know. If they don't fuck up, I'm not going to know. I still think it's insane. Just go get a haircut. I'm not going to – I trust Dana. Dana is – that. that's my girl. Like I'm not letting anyone else touch my hair. That's fair. That's fair. Shout out Cheryl. Love her. She's never, she's never messed up. It, the, the guard fell off. There's nothing she could do about this. And honestly, not even that noticeable until I tell you. Nobody saw it last night. So uh, we're going to wrap up here by doing some podcast reviews. Do we have any? No, we don't. You guys are slacking. No reviews for us to read. Should I, should I check if we got a Frankie Peppers? Yeah, check if we got a little Frankie Peppers. I got a feeling we do. He's just he's actually. Just... We do have Frankie Peppers <sighs> five hours yeah. ago. That's five hours seconds, ago. Right after the game ended. Let's go, Frankie. All right, so this is a fresh take from Frankie. We're going to close out with fresh tanks from Frankie Peppers after Fra- the Sunday Frank- loss. No, Frankie's fresh takes. Frank- Frankie's fresh to Frankie. Uh, we got to keep Peppers in there. Frankie's fresh takes. Side of Peppers. Boys, it's Frankie Peppers. Hey, boom. Uh, hey. 
I did the the three beers for Paulie Blackburn, drink three beers whenever Paulie pitches day, and uh, don't really carry beer in the house no more, but my son's friends gave me this nice, uh, this nice dogfish head stout beer a few months back, so it's been aging a little bit, and I had those, had those three, and uh, I'm feeling a little, uh, feeling a little funny. <laughs> can't hang with the boys like I used to but, uh, not a bad series puts a little bit of a bad taste in your mouth with this last game but it happens uh, Lindor is amazing Severino, come on you can't beat him I feel really sick <laughs> I, I'm dying, I will talk to you soon <laughs> That was actually like a like a call into the Mike Francesa show, hundred percent. I love the you telling us how good I feel. I'm dying. I don't feel well. <laughs> Shout out Frankie Peppers, keeping it light at the end of this. But maybe that's why we, we lost. Got. We didn't drink beers today. Yeah, no, I, I didn't have one beer today. Too many yeah. last night. Yeah, had a lot last night. Definitely. Uh, that's a problem. Water and Coca Cola. <laughs> that's what I've drank today. Send them home. Send them home. Thank you guys for listening and watching. Make sure you subscribe to the Messed Up Podcast YouTube channel if you want to see the video version of this. If you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, drop us a rating, drop us a review, download, and subscribe. Follow James on Twitter at James underscore Shiano. I'm Giraffe Nick Mark with a C. Thank you for listening and watching, and we will catch you after the Orioles series, maybe even see you at the game on Wednesday, hopefully. Peace out. Peace out. See you guys next time.